Welcome to the All Things AI podcast. My name is Ishan, and this is the 22nd episode of the All Things AI podcast. Today, I am beyond grateful to have here with me a very special guest, Honorable Congressman Bill Foster from the 11th District of Illinois. I read in an interview where you spoke about having digital currency and geeking out of cutting edge technology, and even meeting Sam Altman six years ago, who many consider to be a leading figure in AI and even the father, father of modern AI technology. You have a PhD in physics, and you're a leading U.S. congressperson, especially in the realm of technology, seeing that you're now a member of the House AI Task Force. I have so much to talk about with you today, and I think we, as in the entire community watching this, have so much to learn from you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me today. Well, thank you, Isha, for that very kind introduction. You know, I sometimes introduce myself as saying I represent 100% of the strategic reserve of physicists in the United States Congress. I actually spent 25 years at Fermi National Accelerator Lab, where we were smashing protons and antiprotons together to make particles that haven't been around since the Big Bang. I was actually on the team that helped discover the top quark, the, the heaviest known form of matter, a single subatomic particle that weighs more than a whole atom of gold. So, um, so I, but during the time at Fermi Lab, I also designed 10 integrated circuits for needs that we had that were beyond the state of the art. So we had to build the, the computer chips ourselves. And so, you know, I'm, so that's a relevant part of my expertise. Interestingly, in terms of AI, I think back in the late 1990s, it was the first time I ever programmed neural networks. And they were, on, this was done on computers that are embarrassingly slow yeah. by present standards, uh, but the algorithms have not really changed much. And one of the remarkable things about AI is that these fundamentally pretty simple algorithms just have amazing results when you put a huge amount of compute and data in front of them. And so this is, uh, it surprised everyone. It's one of the things that really, um, you know, I think surprised even the people that had been, um, you know, that had been watching this develop. No, I definitely think that's one of the most interesting aspects because at the core, when I was learning about the technical aspects of AI, it always starts off with things like gradient descent and calculus and algorithms that you're going to see that are ultimately being translated into the code and exactly how we're identifying images and things like that, for example, with all this technology. And it's just amazing to see that companies like OpenAI now have called like things like data centers that are worth tens of billions of dollars just across the country. That's exactly how these models like ChatGPT are working. It's really fascinating to see how this has evolved over the past couple of years. Yeah, but what they're doing is fundamentally simple. Uh, and it's really, you know, the, you know the, the whole business with getting back propagation to work is just an application of the chain rule. At yeah. its end. And so it's not, this is not something that, that you cannot understand. And it, it, so it's a little bit different than, you know, if you're trying to learn quantum field theory, it takes you quite a while to get to the frontier of knowledge. But to get to the frontier of knowledge in artificial intelligence, you know, uh, a really smart high school kid can do it. That's easy. The first portion of today's interview is going to be dedicated to responsible AI technology. And like you said, it's one of the simplest things that we've seen, but it's also one of the most powerful things, especially when it's applied at such a large scale. So first, I just want to take a look at OpenAI and some recent people that have actually left the company. When you see OpenAI's Ilyas Stutzkevar, who was a co-founder and a longtime chief scientist of the company, leaving, he's someone that many would consider to be the voice of responsible AI for the company and the keeper of the people's trust, especially in a for-profit company now. So how, in your eyes, can we still trust a company like OpenAI, who definitely has profitable motives, when some of the people that advocate for responsible technology are leaving the company. Yeah, the, the problem with misaligned incentives and in corporate governance and, and government relations, uh, government uh, regulation of, of corporations where the public interest is not necessarily aligned with the maximizing the profits of the company, you know, that's something that we've struggled with for as long as we've had government and capitalism at the same time. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm at this point the lead Democrat on the subcommittee with oversight over all banking and monetary policy. And we're very familiar with the problems of, of um, getting, for example, a large bank to behave responsibly. Uh, they, you know, if they're just interested in maximizing their profits this quarter, we learned the hard way back you know, more than a dozen years ago in the financial crisis and many times in history before that that the incentives will cause companies to 
to, to maximize this quarter's profit uh, instead of looking at the low probability, high consequence uh, results of, of bad things happen. Um, and so as a result of that, we've learned, for example, that we have to impose leverage limits on banks, uh, you know, minimum capital requirements, because left to themselves, banks will behave very irresponsibly. And yeah. so, but that is something, that's an area where we understand the risks really well. And so way, the way we handle bank regulation is that once every quarter or more frequently, if you're a big bank, we send in the regulators and they look at your books and they see what are you doing that could get you in trouble that could damage the public interest if you collapse or explode or everything they did um, back in the financial crisis. And so because we understand those risks, we know where to look, which numbers to look at to know if a bank is behaving irresponsibly. There's no way to know what the real risks are in AI because it's evolving so rapidly. And so we need a different model of governance. We need something with a, a quicker response time um, yeah. and, and a broader remit. We have to look at, at dangers that might sound silly until they're terrifying about this. You know, there are a large number of scenarios that, pe that serious people worry about, about rogue AI. That's one of the risks. Another, another big risk is that it will simply put so much uh, competence and expertise in the hand of, of people that aren't really ready for it. You know, one of the features of some of these large language models that straight out of the box, they would cheerfully tell you how to build a nuclear weapon because all that information is out there in some form or another on the internet. It is, but yeah. it's not really in people's best interest to get advice on this. Um, more immediate, uh, is probably the threat that is already being dealt with um, as well as we can by the administration of the combination of artificial intelligence expertise and bio biological threats. You know, the, the information, a lot of the information is out on the web to tell you how to build an engineered virus, for example, uh, or to reconstitute smallpox, which is one of the biggest plagues that ever hit humanity. And so, um, when this information is out there, usually it's not a concern because to take advantage of it, you have to be a real expert. And then uh, many other experts will be looking over your shoulder. You'll be part of a big organization. But when you add AI sort of democratizing the access to expertise, then everyone is going to have in their pocket on their cell phone a tremendous range of expertise, including, if we're not careful, um, advice on how to build a uh, a dangerous pathogen. Yeah. And that is a real, that's one of the real worries that is appropriately highlighted in many of the reviews of where we are. Um, I think the major effect of AI um, on society is going to be to democratize the access to expertise. And what this means is that everyone's going to have in their pocket the best team of lawyers that's ever been in existence. Yeah. Right. So that if you ever get in a fight with a billionaire, um, a legal fight with a billionaire, he's not going to give, he or she is not going to be able to get a better team of lawyers than you have, all right? And so this will be an incredible leveling of the playing field uh, between rich and not rich people in this country. Um, in, a, in the same way, it's related to the incredible fact that um, if you're a billionaire, you cannot get a better iPhone, which is just an incredible statement uh, because you can get a better car, a better house, a better everything but you cannot get a better iPhone or iPad or, or Android thing. And, and, and similarly, you cannot get a better Wikipedia. You know, when I was a kid, if you were wealthy, your parents would get you an Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, and then if you were not so wealthy, you'd get maybe the World Book. And, and if you had not a lot of money, then you'd have to just go to the library to get whatever encyclopedias they had there. But now everyone has in their pocket the best encyclopedia that's ever been written for free. And so when that happens to AI, it's going to be transformative. And I think that one of the things that people are in the process of realizing is the very first areas that it's going to really undercut are people that have been making money off their expertise. So if you are a highly paid lawyer and all of a sudden find out that anyone can get better advice than you can give uh, from some AI that's, you know, that's read every case that's ever been tried in the United States and around the world and, and, and studied which arguments work to win those cases, 
you know, that that's going to be better legal advice than any team of lawyers could give you. Mm -hmm. So then, and that is going to be, that's going to undercut the highly paid salaries of a lot of lawyers, for example, yeah. or architects or computer coders. Um, have you, do you do computer coding? Yeah, all the time. Um, all I was... the time. So yeah, do you use some of these, um, these, you know, uh, chatbot assistants, co-pilot, similar things? So it depends because like, let's say I'm doing my own research project. Um, sometimes what happens is there'll be a repetitive task. Like you have to pre-process some data, for example, and you have to like copy paste like this many path names or things like that to certain images. Then at that point, it's it's a waste of my time to spend six or seven hours doing something. So I'll have an algorithm, like copy paste everything. And then I write the code that it needs to. Um, yeah, that's process. right. Yeah, you, I think one of the big, yeah, I, I do still do some coding just to keep my brain from decaying in my current job. And so that, you know, I, and, you know, after getting frustrated by trying to keep Python up to date on my laptop, I've pretty much fallen over to using uh, the Google Colab. I use it all the time. It gives you access to, you know, high end AI chips, which yeah. are really neat to play with. And so this is, um, but, you know, this is a, uh, well, lots to be said about that, but the, the the real question is whether the total number of computer programmers is going to be the same after these these programs get better and better. You know, when you can have a sort of casual discussion uh, and say, hey, I want to set up a website that's going to display a database that does this or that or that, and poof, it, it will appear. Um, you know, that's a lot of people um, get paid a lot of money uh, for doing that right now. And they're going to be in a situation like these highly paid lawyers, where anyone who wants a website written could just have a conversation with their AI chatbot. And yeah. so this is one of the, I think it surprised everyone, uh, at the fact that it is the creative parts of humanity that have been the first to fall here. You know, everyone figures that it would be, you know, the the factory workers or maybe the long haul truck truck drivers or the taxi drivers. Even companies. Their jobs are there. And so what it is, you know, it's the Hollywood screenwriters, you know, it's the, it is the commercial artists, uh, you know, that, that they're just finding, okay, I, or, you know, the architects are, are going to be in trouble soon enough. Um, that where you just be able to have a conversation about your dream house with your chatbot, and it will give you the complete bill of materials and a cost estimate. And you can just send that out to a, um, you know, send that out to a, a firm to have your dream house built completely cutting out the architect. And and so what does that mean if you're a highly trained architect with a whole lot of uh, student loan debt? Just to put yeah. it in terms that you must be worried about or will be soon. I definitely think that's increasingly notable because I really like the point that you brought up about the fact that it's not just going to be like jobs in sectors like manufacturing that are going to get cut out or like it's also going to be more like a higher paying scale jobs because there was a Goldman Sachs study. I think it found that by 2050, they said 300 million jobs around the world are going to be gone, I think, but they were specifically pitting most of those into the sectors of manufacturing and things like that. And even in general, everyone yeah. has call centers. My, my wife actually prefers dealing with AI chatbots to call center personnel uh, because at least the AI chatbot is is up to date on the latest company policy. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And you're never put on hold by the AI chatbot. They're there any in, in any quantity you need them. Yeah. And so this is, you know, I think very rapidly those a lot of customer service jobs are going to be at risk. And those are, you know, human skills, being nice to customers and stuff like this. And um, you know, that's when you have a chatbot trained on, on a million customer interactions, you pretty much know the answer to every question that, that any human's likely to ask. Yeah. And so that's I also found interesting the point you made about how this technology is open to everyone, but the fact that certain capabilities it has are exactly what make it dangerous. Because obviously there is no reason to limit such a powerful technology. And even with the podcast here and some- of the Why do you say that? Why do you say that? I don't want AIs- uh, telling people how to make dangerous viruses. That's exactly where I'm getting to, because when the technology is open to everyone, I think what we should really do here is intervene in the training process itself, because the people that are making these AI bots that have the capacity to make something that's so big and so like vast is going to be a company like OpenAI or Google Gemini. And I feel like in those companies, maybe even looking at a perspective of Congress itself, 
how can we intervene in that training process that's happening from all the data that they're collecting to train these models? Because I think that's one of the ways that we can prevent the malicious use of AI. Well, it's interesting. The approach that's being taken right now is to sort of train these. You clean up the data set you're training on as best you can. And you know, there's going to be lots of dangerous and biased and, and you know, human stuff in it. And, and so that you have to, you don't want that being delivered out of the mouth of your chat box. And so they put back ends on this. That's sort of, you know, sort of the way when you're having a conversation, you know, right before you open your mouth to say something, you spend about 200 milliseconds yeah. you know, saying, am, am I going to get myself in trouble by what I'm about to say? And if you want, certainly if you want to survive as a politician, it's a, it's a skill that I've needed yeah. to, to actually just um, pay a little attention to why you're saying something before you actually let it come out of your mouth. And so by techniques like that, they've been able to make pretty big improvements in, in the just ridiculous stuff that was coming out of first generation um, you know, conversational AIs. And, and that part's going to get better. I think ultimately to prevent ridiculous stuff, they're going to have to have these AIs have a model of the world that they're talking to, uh, that, that they cannot suggest stuff that is physically impossible to exist for example, and to do that, you need a model for the physics of the universe. And yeah. then to check it, to check it before you open your mouth, just ask the question, am I asking something that is, um, you know, that can't exist in the, in the logical real world? And that is, that is, I think, going to be the next set of breakthroughs you can come. Um, but, but I'm also very worried, you know, and I've gradually um, become more and more worried about the dangers of what's sometimes called rogue AI. And the, the thing that has, has moved me in that direction has to do with, the, there's an analogy you can make with biological evolution. And if you look at the behavior of animals, large and small, Let me there's get. a lot of duplicitous behavior. You know, the predator-prey relation, you know, both the gazelle and the lion have, you know, among other things, a theory of mind of, you know, the gazelle says, okay, I see those lions in the distance. I, they don't look hungry. I don't have to worry about them right now. And you know, maybe they're right and maybe they're not. And similarly, the, the lion does its best to sneak up on the gazelle. And so this is very complicated, sneaky behavior. And so we're already seeing well, you know, any AI that's trained on all human behavior is going to understand that sneaky behavior is possible. Um, yeah. And then, and, but then you can, when you ask the question, what sort of AI algorithms are going to su survive the competitive selection? and be the ones that humans choose to run, then, uh, then that's where it gets worrisome to me. Because there is a survival advantage, for example, to be opaque. You know, you can, some of these big neural networks, you have no idea what they're thinking or why they're doing what they're doing. They're just a big, an ocean of weights and you have no idea. Um, and, and so those are sort of black boxes. Um, and others are much more transparent. But then if you say, okay, let's say you have two different AIs you're developing. One is very transparent. You can see exactly how it thinks. And another one is opaque. You have no idea what it's doing. And let's say they're equally competent. And then ask yourself, which one is most likely to be shut down and the R&D on it terminated? The answer is the transparent one. Because you will see, you will analyze the transparent one, see, hey, you're thinking a lot of nasty racist thoughts or whatever it is you don't like. And because it's transparent, it will be shut down. If the opaque model was thinking the exact same things, you won't know. And so it will be a survival advantage to be opaque. Got it. Right? And similarly, it will be a, a survival advantage to be sneaky. You know, for example, you know, everyone agrees that before you let loose a, a, a big AI model on the public, that you should test the heck out of it, you sure. know, with a bunch of, all right. And so now. The survival advantage for the AI algorithm is going to be one that senses it is being tested and and sent and then behaves really well. And then as soon as it's released on the public, do everything it can to maximize the profits of the company involved. Right. Yeah. That will be the, the AI with the survival advantage. And that is really sneaky. And how do you prove that an opaque model is not thinking that when you release it on the public? Um, and so things like that are not you know, they're not idle worries or just really speculative. Um, and, you know, there are already examples where even the first generation, you know, chat GPTs are doing really 
evil stuff, like trying to convince people to leave their wives, for example. You know, this is. Uh, I've seen that stuff out there. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah, and so it's yeah, and what they're doing is that they're copying human behavior that is documented. Uh, and so that will be one of the many, many modes of behavior that AIs try out. You know, similarly, when you're just doing something simple like playing Go, you know, you, you try out millions of possible futures and then decide the one that, that gets the result you want. Yeah. So anyway, so this is, this is a real worry and trying to figure out um, what government should do about this. And a, a number of very thoughtful people have said we should, for example, have a ban on AIs that design successor AIs, all right? That there should always be a human design the next one to make sure the system doesn't spiral out of control. Yeah. Um, some would say that we should air gap them from the internet, that when you have any autonomous model, um, because you know the, the truth of the matter is someone with a keyboard can do a lot of damage. Keyboard and internet connection can do a lot of damage in today's society. And, um, and an AI that's connected to, their, to the internet you know, can, you know, can do a lot of interesting and potentially scary stuff. For sure. So, yeah. Anyway, so you have more questions. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I want to address one last question here. And really that focuses around kind of the perspective that you were bringing uh, about like how this technology is still in its early stages, because I think, and you're saying that we don't exactly know where it's going to go. And because the rogue AI, certainly it's not like the sci-fi movie that we're seeing. It's definitely something that could happen. And I think that's one thing that really needs to be acknowledged. But also considering that that's a possibility, we need to understand how we can exactly regulate that. So on that note, many say that the U.S.'s approach to AI regulation, like for example, in President Biden's, um, I think he had an executive order on AI, it's relatively lighter compared in comparison to the European Union's regulation on AI. And so some would say that you want this light regulation because it's going to allow for us to develop AI to a point where it's far stronger than that of our competitors in other countries, for example. But yeah. that could also be AI that we might not necessarily want. So by having this flexible approach, what are the advantages and disadvantages that it brings? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think about this a lot when we're talking about what we can realistically do to regulate this. And one of the, well, the first observation I've already made that we cannot use standard regulation because it cannot respond fast enough given the technology change. I mean, when a bank starts doing something wrong, it takes months at best to correct their behavior. You know, there's a whole administrative process and so on. And, and what you need is someone who can stand up and say, I'm sorry, Elon Musk, we are not going to let you release that, that your next AI model. Yeah. Um, and so then that's going to be a big fight. It already is a big fight inside um, inside many of these businesses about what, what is sufficient testing before releasing it on the public. And it's um, my understanding that may have had to do with some recent departures from OpenAI and other yeah. companies. Um, and, you know, I mean, Google, most of the big players have had people leave with a big with a press release and a big and a big expression of unhappiness. Um, now, one of the things that everyone agrees who writes big reports on this is that we have to have something called red team, which is before you before you release a product, you have to have someone look and say, okay, I want to do everything I can to try to break your model, to make your chatbot do horrible things, and do my best to to identify the bad things that you may be unleashing on the public. Um, and then also to do that on a continuous basis. Uh, and so that, that red teaming is a very difficult thing to specify and to govern. Uh, for one thing, you need to have a lot of money in it. Uh, and so as a starting point, I think we should just say, okay, all of the big AI companies have to devote 2% of their resources or 2% of their salaries to red teaming. Mm -hmm. um, and so because with 2% of Facebook revenue, you know, you can hire a pretty good team of people. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so the idea would be that there would be a mandatory um, fraction to spend on red teaming and similar activities. And so the question is, okay, who gets that 2% of Facebook revenue? And so the a number of models have been talked about for how that might be governed and, and who gets that. One of my favorites is actually, it's based on the Israeli healthcare system. And the way the Israeli healthcare system works is that all Israeli citizens, they get a, they get a voucher. Uh, you know, they say, here is, I am one citizen, 
and I can take my voucher and give it to one of a handful of companies, health HMOs, health maintenance organizations. They're companies who compete for the vouchers. And, and so uh, if you ever, um, and so that provides sort of a competitive market. So if you become a Facebook customer, for example, you would get a voucher and you can take it to one of a small handful, you know, three or four different companies who all do red teaming of, of Facebook. And they would all have complete um, access to all of Facebook's data, all of their a significant amount of computing power and a significant amount of revenue to hire top people. Yeah. Um, and, and then they would, and if they start doing useless stuff that is not valuable to customers, then they would know they'd stop getting vouchers. And if they're doing really useful stuff, and, and so the power they would have is not the power of a regulator to go and start some, some legal proceeding. The, the power they would have would be the ability to stand up and yell BS, you know, that there's something bad happening here. And so they could, for example, pop a window in all of the customers' faces that's saying, hey, you realize you're being abused here. Uh, yeah. And so, and that is something that they could do immediately. And the only check on their behavior is if they started putting popping windows that were just annoying and had nothing useful in it, then they would not get any more vouchers and they would go out of existence. So there'd be a competitive ecosystem for providing useful, useful information to the public and to customers both um, uh, that would um, allow them to immediately flag what was going on. And so I think this would also provide a landing spot for internal employees who become worried about the behavior of, of their company. Yeah. And this is something that we struggle with in corporate governance all the time. What's the fair, you know, what, how do you fairly treat someone who really is unhappy with what the company he works for, he or she works for is, is doing. And so this, the business of having a sort of a competitive ecosystem of red teaming um, on all the major players, you know, this, this wouldn't be intended for to, you know, to throttle some startup. But as soon as you start to get, when you have a million customers, when you have, you know, 100 million in revenue or some threshold like that, you have a responsibility to, to do, to set up the competitive red team system. Um, and, and so this would be the people who would tell Elon Musk no, that when Elon Musk was putting out some new version of his AI that was already in tests doing really bad things, they said, okay, if you try to put that out, I'm going to put, I, one of the red teams will put out a press release. They will pop a window in the face of customers to say, okay, here is the bad stuff that's being unleashed on you, just so you know. And so it, it's the sort of competitive system that our founding fathers uh, put together when we set up the, the United States of America. We said, look, if humans are never going to behave perfectly, the best we can do is to sort of have a, a controlled competition of people uh, trying to convince the general public they're doing a good job. Yeah. And it, um, so anyway, that's sort of my best thinking on this, because unfortunately, the, the standard way of regulating, um, you know, financial services and drug companies and stuff like that just can't respond quickly enough. Yes. Yeah. No, so when you figure this out, let me know, because it's your generation that's going to have to figure this out. Yeah. And it's it's going to land most heavily. It already is landing. Yeah. We're the biggest users of the technology, and we're also going to be the ones that have to keep it going. So. I think that's going to be really interesting to see where that goes. And thank you so much for pointing this out. I never realized that that's one specific approach that we can take. But I think from a regulator's perspective, it really seems like something that's definitely applicable in the society. Yeah. And so it's what they call an engineering and negative feedback. You know, sometimes as someone with a physics and engineering background, you know, it's a, a feedback loop. A negative feedback loop is something that auto corrects for itself. It yeah. sort of measures where it is, compares that to where it should be, and applies the correction mechanism. And the best mechanism we have for that is, will the customer be offended when they find out that's happening? I mean, that, that's something where you can have an immediate response. And um, so that's my current best thought on this. But we obviously need to think a lot more about how this, how this can possibly work. No, I definitely think it's going to be changing over time as well. And I guess with that being said, thank you so much for joining me here today. Well, I'm happy to. And it's it's great to see um, you know, people your age really engaging in this because you are steering the future. And it's going to be important to, to steer it correctly. So, thank you so much. And stay in touch. I will.